I mean, there was a, graph, a graphic we always used in the flyers against the Vietnam War. And it showed some black soldiers marching through the jungle. And there was a sign carved into a, a stone pillar that said, Black GIs, the same KKK forces in the United States who mistreat you and oppress you are the ones that are sending you to Vietnam. Basically, we got no beef with you, you know, and that's why a lot of black soldiers just didn't refuse to fight. In fact, when I went into the factory, when we started organizing, and I'm jumping ahead, but I want to, it, it, it speaks to what you're saying. When we first formed a militant caucus in the factory to organize against speed up of the assembly line, against discrimination, you know, the first members of that caucus were soldiers back from Vietnam, soldiers of color, Puerto Rican brother who was in the Young Lords organization, black brother who invited me over to his house. And I look up on his bookshelf and he's got Das Kapital by Karl Marx. And I, I was like, whoa, dude, how'd you start reading Das Kapital? He said, well, when I got back from Nam, there were brothers on the base and we had a study group and we'd study some Marxism and some Leninism and some Mao Zedong thought. And we were teaching ourselves why the system oppresses us here and when we're sent overseas to Vietnam. We do have a special guest joining me today. My guest is an activist, active advocate, organizer, former UN, union store, steward, author, and historian, I, I, you can say too. We have Mr. Jonathan Melrod joining me this day. Good to meet you and have you on the channel, Mr. Melrod. Very good to meet you, James, and I really appreciate you having me on today. There's so much going on in the world and right here in the United States. It's a time for everybody to be sort of becoming aware of and paying attention to events going on all around them. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, as I was talking to you earlier, a little bit off camera, one of the things that was uh, something that really was heartening to me is seeing a lot more people, especially a lot of younger people that are really building up. Uh, they're getting on the, in the streets, they're activists, they're organizing, and it is uh, scaring the powers that be in, in, in a good way. Um, and so one of the things that I actually want to start off with is what, what spark led you to being an activist and organizer and how does that translate to where you are today? Yeah, that's a pretty big question, but I'll try and, you know, work through it and give people a little bit of an idea because people say to me often, how did you become political? And I can't say it was my parents or my family. It really, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't that. But I grew up in Washington, D.C. in the 1950s, which was really a, you know, hop, skip, and a jump from uh, from Jim Crow South, from the Jim Crow South. And, yeah. you know, I'll give you a couple examples that I observed as a child that just had a big impact on me throughout my life to up till today. Um, you know, when we were kids, we used to go to Glen Echo Amusement Park in Maryland. And it was all white. I never thought about it at the time, but it, it, before 1960, it was only white kids that were allowed in, white families. Mm -hmm. And in 1960, black students from Howard University in DC started to picket asking that the park be integrated. And the response was vicious. I mean, there were a lot of rednecks and racists that came out of the woodwork, you know, coming down on the students, black students, and eventually pouring bleach into the pool so that nobody could swim, black or white for that matter, and they closed Glen Echo for a period of time. Eventually, of course, it was desegregated, but it took that much. And you know, we as kids were like, it, it didn't make any sense. Black kids, white kids, swimming in the pool together. You know, that's something that you have to, society has to imprint on you, racism and separatism, you know? It doesn't come from when you're a child and you're you you know, you're just open to everybody. So, and in that, 
you know, there were more examples. Remember once when we were young, my father took us for a drive out in Virginia on a Sunday and there was a black chain gang. Everyone was in it was black, wearing, you know, big black and white stripes, chained together at the feet and at the shackled at the arms. And, you know, these big overweight, you know, white Southern police carrying shotguns, riding on horses. And it, it left me with this sort of questioning about wh why was this going on? Why were, why were certain people being treated this way? Yeah. And then in 1964, you know, we were starting to pay attention to the world and three young civil rights workers who were down South organizing voters, black voters, Schwerner, Cheney, and Goodwin were murdered. And well, first they were arrested by the police in Mississippi, and then they were allowed out the back door of the police station and handed over to the KKK, mm. and they were killed. Wow. And I decided, hey, they are only a few years older than me, and that could have been me, and I needed to do something. So I took three buses, I was in DC, across the city, to work at SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Organizing Committee. At that time, it was A. Trap Brown and Stokely Carmichael right there in the DC area. And wow. again, to get there in the middle of the summer, I'd have an air conditioned bus in the Northwest side of DC where most whites live. As soon as I transferred in the black community, they'd be old raggedy buses with no air conditioning. And DC is always about 90 or 100 in the summer. So those lessons keep kept appearing to me that we lived in a very unequal society. And I wow. think that, that was my initial, my initial impetus to become active. And when I was working at SNCC every day, I'd be sending out letters with Schwerner, Cheney, and Goodwin's picture on them, trying to get out the word of what was happening to young civil rights workers in the South. Yeah. Wow. And so, you know, uh, from from what I have been, because I've been doing a little bit of reading, um, you also had been a uh, active in the union sector, uh, especially in regards to like the UAW, the uh, Steelworkers Union. And so that, you know, ushered you even further into more activism work, if you can talk about that just a little bit too. Well, if you don't mind, I'll just preface it by activism at the university, because that's really what took me into making the decision to go to work. Oh, in, in we can times. definitely go there right now. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I went to the University of Wisconsin-Madison and I went there very purposely because it was known as the most political, radical school in the country where the wow. student movement was, you know, really tremendously active. Students for a Democratic Society was the organization we were all in at the time. And there were 100,000 college and high school students in it. And it was, you know, it was based on opposition to the Vietnam War and support for the Black Liberation Movement. And so the first week I got to college, I found out that I was going to be forced, required to take ROTC classes. Well, there was an SDS meeting reserve officer training classes. And we met and the freshman said, we don't wanna be taking ROTC classes. They're basically preparing us to become second lieutenants in Vietnam. We don't want the university creating more officers to lead troops in a, what's a war that's a civil war that the United States should never have been involved in. And yeah. that first week at the university, I was designated with disrupting my ROTC class. So I wow. stood up in the middle of the session and I confronted the second lieutenant who was running it, trying to tell us the benefits of being in the military. It would pay for our schooling and we could, we could all become leaders of men. And I said, look, we're fighting an unjust war. I'm here to tell you that I support the National Liberation Front because they're fighting for liberation. And you're, you know why so many second lieutenants are getting fragged, shot in the back by their own soldiers? It's because American young men do not want to be fighting there. 
And in the end, if you read about it, really the reason the U.S. got out of Vietnam was they lost control of the military. The, oh. the guys would go out into the jungle 200 yards and they'd sit down and they wouldn't fight. They just said, to hell with this war, we're not participating. Basically, they went on strike. And there were 250 newsletters and newspapers on military bases, in coffee houses near military bases, and in the military itself opposing the Vietnam War. So that's where a lot of our activism came from as college students. Wow. And, and I also heard stories about particularly a lot of black Vietnam vets where they would go to fight in Vietnam and then the Vietnamese, the Viet Cong wouldn't kill them. And they basically took mercy on them because they knew what they were going through in the United States. And a lot of the Vietnam vets, the black ones said, why are, you know, why are we being more respected by the Viet Cong than we are by the people here in the United States? And so that radicalized a lot of them coming back. And then on top of it, you have a lot of white Vietnam vets that are going, what are we there for? We're literally massacring people for what? And this is something that a, a lot of us have um, weren't told, you know, because I'll be 40 in a couple of years, a couple of years, a couple months. And one of the things we weren't taught this when I was growing up in school. Yeah. And so a lot of us are going, well, why were we there? And then what happened when my senior year, 9-11 happened? And so there was this whole fanfare about why we got to fight for our freedom. But then come to find out it was all for what you and I both know is imperialism. That's really ultimately what it's about. And so that's got to be, I mean, that during that time had to be such a big thing because, you know, that was the draft too, right? Like you, if you got drafted, you either had to be a conscientious objector and go to jail or you had to go fight. Well, I think what you're saying is 100% true. I mean, there was a, graph, a graphic we always used in the flyers against the Vietnam War. And it showed some black soldiers marching through the jungle. And there was a sign carved into a, a stone pillar that said, Black GIs, the same KKK forces in the United States who mistreat you and oppress you are the ones that are sending you to Vietnam. Basically, we got no beef with you, you know, and that's why a lot of black soldiers just didn't refuse to fight. In fact, when I went into the factory, when we started organizing, and I'm jumping ahead, but I want to, it, it, it speaks to what you're saying. When we first formed a militant caucus in the factory to organize against speed up of the assembly line, against discrimination, you know, the first members of that caucus were soldiers back from Vietnam, soldiers of color, Puerto Rican brother who was in the Young Lords organization, black brother who invited me over to his house. And I look up on his bookshelf and he's got Das Kapital by Karl Marx. And I, I was like, whoa, dude, how'd you start reading Das Kapital? He said, well, when I got back from Nam, there were brothers on the base and we had a study group. And we'd study some Marxism and some Leninism and some Mao Zedong thought. And we were teaching ourselves why the system oppresses us here and when we're sent overseas to Vietnam. So that made a tr had a tremendous impact. And I, two of my best friends who were activists with us in the factory, one was black and one was Puerto Rican, their jobs were to go into villages way deep into the jungle and burn them down. And both of them could not live with themselves. They used to tell me stories of taking torches, you know, flamethrowers, excuse me, and just burning huts with grandmothers, with children in them. And both of these brothers, it had affected them so deeply psychologically that both killed themselves. Um, you know, they were active and that while that took their attention, 
they stayed focused. But after the movement sort of fell apart, they ended up um, killing themselves because they couldn't live with themselves. Um, so that's the devastation. I mean, we know what it did to the Vietnamese, and that's the devastation it did to our guys that came back and had a conscience and really couldn't live with themselves for what they had been ordered to do. But let me get to where I, you know, I'm in school and I'll talk about why I went into a factory to be an organizer, like you referred to. You know, when we were in school, there was a, so much politics swirling all around. And Chairman Head Fred Hampton of the Black Panther Party in Chicago, who there's been a movie about, who was murdered by the police, set up by the FBI, he used to come speak to us. And he'd say, and he'd look us like, you felt like he was looking at you right in the eye. And he said, if you're a student radical and you want to change this society, then you need to be a revolutionary because only revolution will bring about the kind of transformative change and an end to exploitation that we all want. And that really turned a lot of us into revolutionaries. And we joined an organization at the time, Revolutionary Youth Movement Two, And it stood on two principles. The first principle was support for the Black Panther Party. The second was a pledge to either go into the military to organize against the Vietnam War or to go into the factory to organize working class people to oppose the system once we left college. So I chose, along with 20 or 30 other of my student comrades, to move to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and go to work in an auto factory, organizing in the union. But we organized within the union, but sometimes we had to organize to fight the union as well as the company. Because mm. you didn't walk in and automatically find a union that was willing to back up rank and file activists and rank and file struggle. So the first first thing that we did was started, you know, started talking amongst ourselves and getting to know people who really wanted to stand up to the company and wanted to fight back. And like I said, there were a number of Vietnam vets. There were also a number of black women who had been church women who had a real feeling for organization and solidarity. And then there were just a lot of white kids who were like part of the Woodstock generation. You know, they had expressed their rebellion through music and culture, and they, were, they weren't, didn't want to put up with the boss standing over their shoulder telling them what to do every minute. So yeah. we pulled together this group of young people, and the company came around on a Thursday, and they told us we had to work on a Saturday. And, you know, we got to, I, I got, went home that night, and I started reading the contract. They don't even give you a copy of the contract, but I managed to secure one. And it said all overtime is voluntary and up to the individual. So I went to the copy store and made copies of that page. And when I get into work, we all passed them around. And there was a lot of buzz like, hey, we're not going to go to work. You know, Saturday's our day, you know. So when they came around on Friday and said, you report to work on Tomorrow on Saturday, you could hear it all through the floor. We ain't working. Saturday's our day, you know. And there were so many people that refused, the company couldn't get a workforce. Now, that was good for two reasons. One, we got a right to enjoy life. Our life isn't about six or seven days a week on the assembly line. You know, our life is about, you know, outside of the job and our families whatever it be. Yeah. And secondly, there were a lot of people who were unemployed and not working overtime meant that the company had to hire more people. And that's a basic union principle that used to exist. You don't work overtime while there's unemployed people on the street. You think about them as well. So yes. Them. Oh my God. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. So it, it happened again, you know, we beat them on that one. Yeah. And then they came around and they announced that we'd have to build three more cars per hour with no change in how much work we had to do. That's what we call speed up. And I went to the contract again 
and found the provision in the contract that said you only have to work at a normal pace. Yeah. Together we might. <laughs> You're a painted butt for them. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So we got together and we decided let's write a leaflet and hand it out at the gates of the factory the next day. And yeah. in the old days, you used to have to turn an old mimeograph machine by hand to run off a leaflet. But the leaflet said, are you dead yet? And said, we're not racehorses. We only have to work at a normal pace. Nice. Don't work harder than that. They should hire people if they want to add work to our jobs. Yeah. So the next day we came in and all of a sudden the older workers came alive, the seniority workers. And they showed us, they showed us how they had historically fought speed up, which was you work at your normal pace, no matter how long it takes you to do your job, which means you end up 10 or 20 feet out of your workstation. And you're pushing that next person further down the line and the person after them further down. So what's happening is people are throwing their taillights they're supposed to put into the trunk, the trunk rubber into the trunk because they don't got time to do it. So you could see repairs that needed to be performed on all the cars. They were stacking them on the roof. They were stacking them in the aisles. But they kept trying to run the line. So that night we got together and we said, let's print up our own T-shirts that say, big red stop sign, fight speed up. So we did that. We took them in. 25 of them sold right away. So we went home and we printed more. That day, 150 of them sold company come ar came around and said, anybody who wears that t-shirt to work tomorrow is going to be fired like we did some black workers a couple of years back who wore in black power t-shirts. So I got a little nervous, you know, because I was young and I didn't want to make risk the jobs of some of the older workers. And as I was pondering what to do, my steward came up, union steward, and he bought a t-shirt and said, I'm gonna wear mine in tomorrow. Then the chief steward, who's over an entire department, some 500 people, he came up and he bought one and said, I'm wearing it in. And then the vice president of the union came up and said, he's wearing it in. So when people heard that, the next day, virtually hundreds of people wore in the t-shirts and the company finally caved in, took work off of every one of our jobs and hired a new person for every section. That meant hundreds of new jobs. Wow. And that principle, A, that you could stand up collectively and defend your work pace, but B, that you could force the company to hire unemployed and put them to work. Well, needless to say, after that, the word came out that Bernie Lapinka, the president of the union, in, collabor in collaboration with the international union, says Melrod's got to go. He's a troublemaker. And the word started passing, hey, Melrod's been active with the Black Panther Party, which was true, and everybody knew it. You know, I had been in charge of selling the Black Panther Party paper in Madison, and I had a team of people every week in Madison on the campus, we sold 350 Black Panther Party newspapers to mostly white students who were willing to have open minds. So when I hear these white racists talk about critical race theory and you don't wanna upset white students because they might feel bad about that their grand, their great, great grandparents owned slaves, that's bullshit to me. You know, those white students, if educated and if taught what the true history of this country are, are willing to stand with our black brothers and sisters. So when we went on strike for the black student strike, we struck to get black studies, to get a black studies department, to get a black cultural center, and we shut that university down. We closed down every building on the liberal arts campus. And when they brought in the National Guard with bayonets to push us out of the way from blocking buildings, we called for a march that night. And that night, 10,000 students out of some 30,000 students marched on the state capitol building. That meant that 9,500 of those students were white because there were only 500 black students at that time in that wow. huge campus. So those 9,500 white students were out there fighting for black studies, for the admission of more black students. 
So lessons of history need to be learned by young people today, and it's going on around this Palestinian protest that are happening all over the country. We see that same sort of spark of activism spreading from campus to campus. And as you said to me earlier, these students are fighting imperialism. They're not just fighting a bad war, you know, or an isolated war. They tie it into the whole system of imperialism, which the U.S. props up around the world and which they're using Israeli proxies to create an apartheid state in the Middle East. Absolutely. And in fact, uh, because you mentioned that, I'm so glad you did. I want to share, this is what's been going on over the last five days or so. So uh, if anybody is unaware, uh, students at Columbia University are actually protesting uh, the genocide that's going on in Gaza. Let's just take a look here. The police, uh, the goons of the capitalist state are once again interfering with free speech. We're fine. We're fine. Just let us go. We're fine. Then let us move. So that's basically the gist of what we've been seeing over the last few days. This is nothing new for you to see, uh, Mr. Melrod. Uh, it, it looks like, you know, something that you've seen time and time again in your activism work, right? Yeah, it really is. And, you know, the, the capitalist state never learns its lesson. There's a saying, a Chinese saying, which is picking up a rock to drop it on your own foot. Every time Ooh. they bring in those police as goons, like in that clip that we just saw, they motivate more students to come out the next day. And I was just reading this morning that students at Barnard, the faculty are having a three day sick out to support the students who've been disciplined for Palestinian protests. So this is spreading to campuses all over. As I was telling you, I got an email this morning asking me, could I get some legal observers to go up to Humboldt State University, which is way in Northern California, because students have occupied the buildings to protest the war in Palestine. So, you know, it's going from Humboldt County to Harvard University, you know, to, you know, NYU, to colleges all over the country. And it's pretty inspiring to see these students standing up to the system and fighting for justice and fairness and against genocide in, in, in Palestine. Yeah, here's another one of uh, NYU students that are actually right now they are also starting their own encampment. Uh, as we can see that this is, you know, over the last 24 hours, now NYU is starting camps. Um, I'll mute that for a second. But NYU students, um, University of Michigan students as well, also started camping out on, you know, and occupying the university property. Um, I'm hoping that Central, uh, that University of Central Florida does the same. I'm hoping uh, USF does the same thing. I would love to see um, HBCUs also get into this because the thing is, is that ultimately, you know, one thing that my colleague from RBN, Savvy Stabs, always says is that college is really just a business. And if you really want to affect things, you have to shut that, shut it down. And so, uh, you know, for all the HBC, including HBCUs, shut it down, right? Nobody yep. goes to class until we actually take these endowments and this investments that are to the apartheid state and we shut it down until they divest. And so this is something that I'm seeing in 
this it really it warms my heart to see so many people stand in solidarity with people who are oppressed. Yeah, I, I really couldn't agree with you more. And, um, you know, it, it's very heartening. There was a long period in the country where not much was happening. And for those of us who had been activists all our life, it was pretty tough. But to see the growth of young people right now and their willingness to put themselves at risk to make a strong statement is really encouraging. But I'm going to return back to the to the factory where we had just beaten the speed up and the word came out that the company was going to fire me. Mm. And sure enough, three days later, after we had beaten the speed up and they had added more people to working on the assembly line, three or four guards came up and literally picked me up off my feet because I dug in and refused to leave and dragged me down the the uh, aisleways as other workers were yelling to sit down to protest what they were doing to me. And they carried me down the five flights of stairs and threw me out on the sidewalk. And I looked back and I looked up at those five floors and I said, motherfucker, you mark my words, I'll be back here someday. And I continued to fight for my job for the next two and a half years. And it took two and a half years before the National Labor Relations Board and then the federal judiciary ordered me reinstated, saying that American Motors, that's the company I worked at, which was an automaker in those days, had brought back the McCarthy era, the period in which McCarthyism tagged everybody as a red or a communist and used it to persecute the political movement, to persecute students, to persecute professors and filmmakers. And the judge came down hard on American Motors. So eventually they had to put me back to work. And I was proud to walk back in with a big sign over my head, like a boxer who just won a title ring, uh, belt. And it said, showed the check of back pay that they had had to pay me for being out of the shop for two and a half years. And people were cheering and clapping and it was a great victory and a great moment. I later got my FBI file, which was about a thousand pages. I, it took me four Freedom of Information Act requests to the government to get that file. And if people are interested, it's up on my website. A lot of it, uh, it's just jonathanmelrod.com. Mm -hmm. And the FBI had been the ones who had told American Motors, the company, to fire me. And they said, fire him because there's people at seven other factories doing just what he's doing, putting out the same kind of flyers, and we've got to root them out and don't ever rehire him. So that's what I was up against. The power of a, one of the then top 500 fortune companies in this country, nevertheless, with the support of the workers from that plant, over all those years, we beat them and I went back to work at American Motors. Yeah, that's crazy how the even the FBI got involved in getting you fired. That is that just goes to show where the alphabet bureaucracies are also in line to serve the corporations. They're not in line to actually help you, the the, the citizen. And so because if they were actually there to help you as a citizen, there would have been no reason at all to try to help get you fired from the Federal Bureau of Investigation. That's wild. I mean, it, you know, when I got the whole file, I was I was I don't know if I was shocked, but I mean, they were they were doing the kind of surveillance on us where if there was a meeting at my house they go up and down the block and write down every single license plate of people who are on the street, casting a wide net as they could to try and tag people as radicals. When I was fired at American Motors, like I just explained, I finally got a job at a foundry, one of the toughest jobs in industrial Milwaukee, where we were making axles for Mack truck, Mack truck, Mack trucks. And I was getting close to my 90 days 
when I would be off of probation and be in the union. And on about the 85th day, I walk into work and the night superintendent calls me in and he says to me, John, you're not a bad worker, but I just got visited by people from the federals, the Fed, the feds. He didn't know who they were. And they told me I got to fire you. I don't really want to, but I got to do what they say. So I got fired from that job, you know? So, you know, I had to get smart and, and start using pay phones to try and apply for jobs and, you know, going in circles, trying to see if anybody was following me. And I got back into a steelworkers plant. And that was, that was another really um, important lesson for me in organizing working people. Because when I got to that plant, I was on the second shift. And almost all the people on second shift were young white guys who drove big muscle cars with wide tires. And, you know, I said, all right, well, you know, I got to organize these guys. I'm an organizer. I went in here to do something, you know, to create a fight back movement. So I started hanging out in the tavern after second shift every night. And I had never been around people that use the N word so much. And at first I try and just argue and I say, you know, why do y'all got to keep saying that shit? You know, I mean, we're all the same and it just divides us. Well, they didn't, you know, talking to them, they didn't want to hear from it. And I said, well, why are, where did you get this level of distrust and dislike for people of color? And here's a really important lesson. They said, look, we spent our young lives in juvenile detention. And in juvenile detention, you split up into a white group, into a black group, into a Latino group, and you got to fight each other if you want the changer for the television and you want to watch your shows, then you got to fight for that. So the system created these divisions. They put each other people, they created a material condition. If you wanted an extra dessert, you had to grab it from the Latino guy. You know, if you were a white guy, you had to grab it from the black guy. So this becomes like institutional racism that gets beaten into their minds. So I said, I got to work at this. You know, it's not going to come overnight changing people's minds. So our contract was ready to expire. And these guys had never been in the union, never been organized. And I said, hey, guys, let's get together after work and figure out how to fight for a good contract. First night, nobody showed up. Just wasn't in their, you know, wasn't in their thought process that you could organize and fight the union and the company for better conditions, better wages, et cetera. So the second time I said, all right, we're going to meet at Eyebolt's house after work and I'm going to buy pizza and beer. So we went over there and this time we had about 10 guys and we created, we, we printed a leaflet that said on this and th such and such date, our contracts expired. If we don't have a good contract, we walk out at midnight and we listed what the main contract demands were. And the only way I could get these guys to hand out the flyer was to organize them the next night. I'd buy the beer. We'd all go to Eyebolt's house. We'd play cards for an hour or two. We'd catch some sleep. We'd go out and hand out the flyer to the first shift workers. Well, I woke up at five o'clock. None of them had gone to sleep. They'd been playing cards all night. And I said, time to go to the plant and flyer. And there was a lot of grumbling. They had never done it, but they all came. And workers were coming in. And one of the first workers was a very conservative white guy. And he said to one of our guys, whose name was Wild Man, he was a big guy and he was Wild Man because he was known for fighting. And the guy says to him, I don't want your commie leaflet. Wild Man takes it and stuffs it down his shirt all the way in says, you read this leaflet. And that was his first experience with, you know, getting out there and trying to organize. So we met afterwards and we said, look, People aren't going to accept this right away, and we got to keep at it. So we made up buttons that said, no contract, no work. Contract came ready to, be, to expire, and the union was gone. They're what we call a business union. They didn't want to have nothing to do with this rebellion. So we walked out at midnight, and we held a rally. So as I said, the leadership of the union disappeared, and it was up to us to organize the people. 
So if people were threatened with being evicted or being late on their mortgage payments, we put out our phone numbers and said, you call us, we'll be there to move your furniture back into the house. Nobody's going to get evicted during this strike. When the Steelworkers International Union refused to pay the young guys strike benefits, we decided we'd go pick up the International Union downtown. Well, when they heard about that, they started paying strike benefits to everybody. Oh. People started not having enough food. Back in those days, you could go get surplus government cheese and peanut butter and yeah. butter. And we went and got that out and handed it out to the people. So the people began to see us as leading the strike. When they brought in trucks with scab drivers, non-union drivers to cross the picket line, we started making up these jacks that had a sharp point on every part of the jack, like those kids' jacks when you play jacks. And we'd walk by and we'd put them all under the truck. So by the time the truck was ready to go back out, every tire would be flat on the truck and they couldn't move out the scab, scab made tanks. So we were, we were getting pretty militant by then. And the word came out that the judge had ordered that Eibolt, the young guy whose house we used to have our meetings at, that they had repossessed his cherry red Trans Am. And now everybody got upset. And they said, Melrod, you got us out here. You convinced us that we could win this strike. But now look, Eibolt lost his car. What are you going to do about it? So I, you know, I thought about it in a while and I said, all right, look, we're going to go back and we're going to get his car back. We're going to go to GMAC, that's GM's financing company, and we're going to throw up a picket line and we're going to go inside and we're going to get the keys. And they said to me, come on, Melrod, you can't challenge the judge and the system like that. You know, we've been put away for stealing cars all our lives as young people. I said, we can beat the system. And the judge is doing the work, like you said, James, of the capitalist system to break the strike by repossessing, by repossessing Eibolt's car. So we went out there and we had 70 pickets or so. All of a sudden, two carloads of black meat cutters who were on strike show up to join the picket line. And all these white guys they were kind of, you know, racist. They're all looking around and you can see they're not quite sure what's going on. But the brothers who were the meat cutters all join in with us and they're picketing and demanding get Eyebolt's car back. So three of us walked in and sat in the manager's office. We said, we want Eyebolt's car back. He said, no, the judge said that we could repossess it. We said, we don't really care what the judge said. And if in five minutes, we looked at my watch, I said, all those people out there are going to be in here in your office, and they're not going to leave until we get the keys. He got nervous. He gave us the keys. We walked out dangling this set of keys, and people were chanting and cheering, and people were ready then to like go back and fight on that strike line. But here's the main part of the story. The next week, I said, we got to go down to the Black Meat Cutters picket line and stand with them. Ooh. And all these same white guys that had been using the N-word and talking the shit before, all of them went down there and we locked arms with the black meat cutters to stop the scabs, the strike breakers. And that's how the lesson got learned about overcoming racial differences. When they could see in day-to-day -day life that our strength grew because of our unity. And those same white guys, years later, were still going to our May Day marches because those lessons stuck with them. They realized that they could march on May Day with other workers from other factories and other nationalities to fight yeah. the system. And I always want to tell that story because, you know, a lot of people talk about, you know, we got to stand up to racism, but they don't go out and do the hard work of organizing to show why together we have more strength and we build more unity. Yeah. Actually, that, that actually brings a question to my mind because there seems to be, and, and I think this is more indicative of the online left, that you have some saying that we need to focus on just class only and just leave race, you know, behind. What is your thoughts on that? Because as someone like myself uh, and, you know, some of us at RBN, we will say that class is actually an identity too. So identity and class intersect. 
but some will say, no, we just got to focus on class. What what say you on that subject? I, I know it's kind of a big question, but if you can kind of tackle that a little bit. It's not really that big a question for me. Since the first black slaves stepped on to this continent, the system has been based on white supremacy. You know, and that's just a fact. You just got to look at history to understand that. Okay. So white supremacy has produced under capitalism a two-tier system. Black people do not have the same opportunities, the same rights, the same treatment from the police, the same rate of admission to colleges as white people do. Now, that's not to say that white people who are in a factory got it good, you know, because, you know, they're also being oppressed by the capitalist system. But if we don't go out and tackle the racism on the job, in the educational system, we can never build a movement that can challenge capitalism because the oppression of black people is part of a class system, but it's something unto its own. You know, mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it's utilized by the system to divide us. And us white people need to recognize that and fight racism. For us, it was on the job. We, they would not give black workers in American Motors relief jobs because that was a little bit better of a job. You got to go around and relieve different people during the day. You weren't on the same monotonous eight hours putting in seatbelts like I did on the same car one a minute. So we said, that's not right. You know, black workers got as much right as white workers to that job. So we started a movement to demand that every relief job be put up on a bid board where everybody could bid for it by seniority. And that showed the black workers we were willing to stand up for that issue where they were not being entitled to being relief people. Okay. And we won that in a contract. And that's a big victory. It may not sound like it, but it's a big victory because we had taken down one notch of white supremacy in the factory. And I could go on and on. I mean, that became one of the planks of our caucus, Fighting Times, which is the name of the book I wrote that you put up on the notes. But I wrote a book, Fighting Times, organizing on the front lines of the class war. And it's uh, right now it's on sale for May Day sale at 50% off at pmpress.org. And you just put in the discount code, abolish work in capital letters. There you go. Brother James has put it up. So, you know, I forgot what we were, where I was just going with that. I'm sorry. I'm 73 and I'm getting a little bit forgetful. It's all good. No, it, I mean, the thing is, is that, you know, we were talking about, you know, the, the, some people who say that we only need to focus on class. Oh, exactly. I'm sorry. Right. You know, not on race. Well, you let know, me give you one, let me give you one more example. You know, sure. There was a there was a bad foreman, you know, I mean, this guy, you know, was really cut from, you know, old school, you know, management is always right. I don't got to listen to the workers on the line. His name was Steve Freeman. And the first people that met Steve Freeman was these two young, a white guy and a white girl were in a bar. He was just new coming in and he said to them, this, this boss, this foreman said, you guys let that go on up here? And they said, what you talking about? And he said, look over in that room. There's a black man dancing with a white woman. We don't let that go on in the South where I'm from. And from that moment on, we knew he was going to be a boss that was going to be bad for all of us. So one of the things he did was he went up to two black women and he said, you know, I'd like you better if you weren't so flat chested. Okay. And we said, we can't let that go, you know, because that's going after women, that's going after black people, and that's going after workers. And so we called him out and we called him in our newsletter, Scab of the Month, because he also would go, this white woman, she was 50, and every time she'd walk by, he'd pat her behind. And she came to me in tears and she said, I'm a respectable woman. I don't have to put up with that. You know, and so we started a petition to get rid of him and every white worker, every black worker, whatever in that 
department signed it. He went up to a black brother and he threw a 35 pound air gun at him. And he said, you're nothing but a lazy MF N word. Okay. So we, then what we did is we had seven stewards follow that foreman around all night. Like they wouldn't leave his, they wouldn't let him out of their sight. And if he so much as picked up a screw or touched a car, we'd write him up and demand one hour's pay because he had done union work. And that grievance would pay the person who wrote him up one hour. So we made Steve Freeman's life so unbearable in that factory that for the first time they had a fire supervisor and they fired him because he was a racist, bigoted, you know, malicious foreman. So that teaches us what the power of unity is and teaches us also that it's not just about class. Those people who say that are misinterpreting the history of struggle in this country and misinterpreting how we build a movement to challenge exploitative capitalism. Thank you for that explanation very much. Um, one of the things that I wanted to share was uh, this site that uh, that from PM Press. Uh, it's pmpress.org, right? Is, as you guys can see, this site looks pretty based. Um, so it has different books uh, that you can go to. Uh, of course, Jonathan Melrod's book is also in here as well. So I, you know, encourage people to go this and um, your, your book is also in here. Yeah, um, it is somewhere. I'm not sure. I mean, we're, we were up to now 3,800 copies of the book sold. And oh, okay. we're trying to get to 4,000, um, which I'm pretty proud of for an independent book. That's, that's pretty good. Um, you know, and a lot of the people you talk about as social media revolutionaries, you know, the one thing I got to say is they've been reading the book and getting back to me about it. And I'm able to talk to them about what you and, James, you and I, James, are talking about right now. So... Mm -hmm. You know, the further we reach out, the further we can talk to people, the more people we win to our understanding of what change has to be made and how we have to go about making that change. As you can see, PM Press has a real good, uh, real good um, listing of catalogs of books that it sells, um, and people should go and check it out. You can for sure find something you like, and you know, for May Day, you use that abolish work code, and you get fifty percent off. And my book yeah. again is Fighting Times. Yeah. There it there is, it right is. there. Yeah. So uh, here it is uh, Fighting Times, uh, Organization on the Front Lines of the Class War. In fact, uh, so it, it's available in ebook, as you can see here. Uh, is it also available in hardback or paperback? Paperback, yeah, yeah. The. Okay. I'm trying to see if I can see the price on there. I think it's eight ninety five dollars for the paperback at 50%. So it's affordable. I wanted to make it as affordable as I could. Mm -hmm. Perfect, perfect. So I'm putting that in there as well. And for anybody that is interested in uh, getting the book, uh, of course, all you got to do is put in the discount code abolish work for 50% off for the May Day discount. So you guys have that there too. Um, that is... It is amazing because uh, I think that um, one thing I was taught, and I have uh, Midwestern Marks to think about, to think about this when they were uh, I was participating in their introduction to Marxism class, and one of the things I learned was the phrase the the phrase dialectical materialism, and one of the things that I learned is that it you have to know how things have came about in order to know exactly you know why things are the way they are now and you giving us this historical context really pushes forward the need for us not only to study the past but to see any of the missteps that may have made and also study the successes and then try to apply what was successful and then 
try to avoid the mistakes. And so I think that's something that is deeply important for us because uh, I, I understand that you say you're 73, but I also look at you as a professor. There's a lot of people who are older, who are uh, professors and, and you know, it, as it were within this movement who I think that we need to glean more from because a lot of times we, we as younger ones, we tend to try to think uh, our ego gets in the way, right? Um, just a question: What was one of the what was one of the biggest lessons that you learned, as well as one of the biggest wins, in your opinion, in your activism work? Yeah, I actually have something that I think will stand as an example of that. In about 1973, there was a Native American reservation in Wisconsin where the Menominee tribe lived. Mm -hmm. And word came out that the Menominee warriors, who were mostly all Vietnam vets, had seized an abbey on the reservation demanding it be made into a medical facility because they had no medical treatment within, I don't know, 100 miles of the reservation. And... I said, you know, this was right after Wounded Knee, where the FBI had killed a number of Native American activists in AIM, the American Indian Movement. And I said, if somebody doesn't go up there to this reservation in Wisconsin, they're going to kill those Menominee warriors. So I decided to go up there with another activist and try and do whatever we could to help them. You know, and it was way up north in Wisconsin. And it's snow back in those days, about three or four feet high. And we yeah. went into the community center where most of the, you know, people in the, in the tribe were hanging out while the warriors were in the abbey. And nobody would talk to us. They didn't want white people on the, on the, on the tribal lands. And it was, you know, at first I'm like, you know, what am I going to do? I said, you just got to keep trying. Keep talking to people. Night came, they went around, served everybody dinner, walked past me and the other white guy that was with me. Didn't serve us food. So I said, all right, let's go get a motel room. We'll come back tomorrow. We came back the next day and we we're talking and talking. Finally, this one young guy says, what are you guys up here for? And I said, look, I've been an organizer all my life since I was 14 years old. And I can tell you, if we don't do something to break the siege, because the police, the state troopers had surrounded the Abbey and there was gunfire going back and forth because all the Menominee warriors were Vietnam vets. In fact, they were so good that when one of the cops walked by carrying a lantern, they shot the lantern out of his hand. They had been marksmen in Vietnam and it was just a warning, nothing more. Okay. But, you know, these, the, the, the state police and the white vigilantes who were, who were called the white committee of something, they were blocking food from getting through to the warriors. So I, so I made this proposal. I said, I'll bring up 500 people this Sunday to march in support of the warriors and we'll march right up to the police lines and break through them to open it up so they can bring in food. And at first they were kind of, you know, who are you? And are you in the FBI? You know, and they finally said, okay, let's do it. We're in, the tribe's in. And they said, but to make sure you're not an FBI agent, you're going to be the first person in the front of the march. So if anything goes down, any gunfire, you're going to be the first to get it. But I called back to my comrades in Milwaukee and Madison, and they put out the word and they organized. And come Sunday morning, 500 people showed up to join the Menominee Warriors on this march. Wow. I heard these young warriors saying, young uh, Menominee who were marching with us, saw all these black guys who had come up with us, and I heard them using the N-word. What are they doing up on our reservation? And I walked over and I said to them just this. I said, look, today ain't about that kind of bullshit. Today is a day that we're all here to defend the warriors. So we're all here for one common purpose. And they stopped that talk. 
you know, again, they could look around and see, you know, that the divisions were less than the unity that we were establishing. So we started marching to the Abbey, chanting, you know, you know, break the, open the police lines, let food in and whatever. And we were getting closer and closer. And those county sheriffs had what you call grease guns. They were carrying automatic machine guns, their own private weapons. And I got to say, it was a little intimidating being the first guy in the first line as we get closer and closer and closer to the police lines. But we had brought up so many people and so many tribal people came out to march. The old people, the young people, they were all there. It brought, it made the governor get involved. The governor ordered the state police out of the area, brought in National Guardsmen and allowed food convoys to get into the abbey. And was, we were, they, the warriors were able to negotiate. That abbey went to the tribe for a medical facility and they all were let out of the abbey. So to me, that was such an inspirational example of what we can do under terrible circumstances under very dangerous circumstances because of the, the battle, gun battles that had gone on with the American Indian movement and the FBI and the police. But we won that and we were able to really bring people together. So that was a proud moment in my life. And there's a picture in the Milwaukee Journal, the newspaper from Milwaukee that I have in my files. And it says, Indians march on Abbey. And it shows mostly Native Americans and then me in the front with the bullhorn, because they had said I had to be there to make sure I wasn't FBI. So, you know, I, I felt that I had been able to accomplish what I set out to. And then I went back to work in the steel plant and we organized there again. Wow. Man, that is amazing. Um, so it, it just as uh, another question, uh, if, if I may, um, sure. I know we're an hour in, but one of the questions that I also had is there are so many of us that are trying to organize now. Um, and what is some advice you can offer to those of us that are really just trying to get our feet wet within the organizing spaces? What is some of the best tips that you can give us in order to dive in just from just a lay person that is just now watching this. Yeah. Who wants to get involved. Right, right, right. Well, one thing, I mean, I don't want to sound like a salesman, but people who ask that question have read my book and have emailed me. I was so inspired. I just took a job at Amazon where I want to be an organizer. So the first thing I say to people is you got to get out among the people and organize. That could be housing. That could be the people who don't have homes. That could be at Amazon. That could be down south in these new EV car plants. You know, I'm working with some union people who are in the Daimler truck plants in North Carolina and at the Thomasville bus plant. And we're organizing there together and they're getting people together to fight for a good contract. And they're uniting people, overcoming the South black and white divide which is the great thing is to see that divide diminish as people begin to organize together. So people got to go out and organize and then listen to what people are saying. You know, there's an expression from Mao Zedong, who when I was a young kid at 15, I wrote a letter to China asking if they could send me some materials on socialism because I didn't think capitalism was really working very well. And three months later, they sent me the selected works of Mao Zedong, four volumes. And in that, there's something that talks about the mass line. And the mass line is going out and listening to people, listening to what they want to change. If it's a grease spill on the factory floor, if it's the fact that they got rats and rodents, if it's the fact that they don't have a roof over their head and they don't have food, get out there and begin to organize those people. And then as you're organizing them, do exactly what James said. You begin to read Marx and you begin to understand what dialectical and historical materialism is, which teaches you a systematic way to look at the world, to analyze why we're in the situation that we are and give you a path forward. 
So, you know, reading, studying, and then putting it all into practice, going out among the people and organizing. And there's a lot of jobs to be had. Right now, anybody can walk, go down south, and that's a challenge, I admit, but getting a job at, you know, any of these new plants that are being built. Volkswagen, 7,000 workers, they just voted for a union earlier this week. The union movement is spreading down south. Honda's the next plant that they're gonna organize. Oh, no, I, excuse me, I think it's Mercedes-Benz is the next plant they're organizing. So, you know, there's a lot of opportunities to get out and organize. And if you're on the campus, you gotta be an organizer on campus because that's where minds are changed and that's where young people learn lessons of what we gotta do together. So I gotta thank you, James, so much for putting me on and thank the people who are listening and encourage them to become active. Right now, the, the, the cause that we're fighting around is the genocide in Palestine. And that's real important. And people got to get out there in the streets and keep that movement alive. Oh, man. It's, you you ended it so well. I can't even follow that, <laughs> Mr. John. It's great. Um, You know, uh, and as far as everybody is concerned, uh, if you guys want to, I'll put the link uh, for his book and his website back in uh, as well. Uh, and I'll also have it in the description. But um it was you know i'm so glad i had you on today because this was a conversation i think that a lot of people really needed to hear because a lot of us get discouraged or one of the things that a lot of people are also i i know i tend to do is i tend to do so much to the point of burnout yeah and yeah. so i want people to realize number one we have to do this collectively which is important, but at the same time is as long as you're doing something while still recognizing your limitations, I think that's also important too. Yeah, I, I think you're really right. I mean, you know, burnout's a real factor and people got to do what they can do, you know, at the same time that they're bringing up their kids, raising a family, you know, you got to balance it all. But, you know, that we, that creates a healthy movement. Some of us kind of, you know, we devoted our lives 24 seven, you know, back in the days of the Panthers and we were working with the Panther party and beginning to organize in the factories. And, you know, we did get burned out and I don't want to see that happen to people. So you're right. We got to take each care of each other collectively. You know, we got to support each other and then we got to get out there and do the hard work of organizing and reinforce each other in that work, not rip each other down over small sectarian, petty political discussions. Hey, none of us know what's exactly the right road right now. Together, we got to find it. Definitely, definitely. Um, also, just uh, to let people know, what do you have? Do you have anything particular coming up and where can they find you? Well, really, I mean, just you know, on my website is an important place to go because it's got a lot more than we've talked about. I mean, it really talks about the years in Madison, the work with the Panther Party, you know, the work in the factory. And, and recently, you know, I, well, I overcame pancreatic cancer, um, which in 2004, they had told me I only had six months to a year to live and that the chemicals from the factory had directly the toxic chemicals that directly caused me to um, get the pancreatic cancer. It took wow. me a number of years to recover from that. I beat it. I beat it. You know, I mean, that's another example that you can, you can win a lot of battles if you determine to do it. And that's what I was. I was determined to beat that cancer because I had young kids, five and seven years old. Mm -hmm. But a lot of that's on the website, including that battle against pancreatic cancer, which has inspired a lot of people who have cancer to let them know that you can beat this, you know, and you can rely on other medicine than Western medicine, you know, alternative treatment, Chinese medicine. And I went through all of that and utilized it all. And I think that's why I'm still here today. So um, I hope you get the book and I hope you're inspired by it. And, you know, James, thanks again for having me. Thank you so very much for coming on. Please come back again soon. I actually want to talk about 
uh, the latest things that are happening in the news and get your thoughts on it. Uh, so please be sure to uh, keep an eye out on your email for whenever I invite you. I'd be you happy to. Be a pleasure. Definitely. Definitely. Sounds good. Thank Sounds great. Thank you so much, Mr. Railrod. It was so good to meet you. All right. Talk to you later. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you so very much for watching my channel, and I deeply appreciate it from the top and bottom of my heart. If you wish to support the channel further so I can keep bringing you content that is educational and informative, you can become a patron on patreon.com forward slash jbfon. You can find that link in the pinned comment or in the description below. No matter what you give, you'll be supporting independent media and education that helps make the world better. Thank you so much, and you can watch more of my content here. Mwah. Forehead kisses, and have a beautiful day.